Once again, I must say how much I enjoyed this week's episode of Genesis Week. I really do look forward to Friday mornings now, so that I can see you demonstrate just how weak Genesis really is, and marvel at how you manage to quote mine and mischaracterize serious science in the mistaken belief that it actually supports your belief in magic. This week's effort was a prime example. In discussing the Live Science article on LiveScience.com, which talks about a study entitled Feeling of Certainty, Uncovering a Missing Link Between Knowledge and Acceptance of Evolution, from the Ohio State University and published in the Journal of Research in Science Teaching, you completely miss the point that the results entirely undermine your own position, and somehow you manage to get the whole thing asked backwards. From the way that you portray the study, your audience is led to believe that evolution is only true because people have a gut feeling that it is. But this is far from the case. The study is actually examining acceptance of a scientific theory rather than making any comment on how plausible that theory is. Is. In the study, the researchers examined the acceptance of the theory of evolution by way of natural selection by Korean trainee biology teachers. Korean trainee teachers were chosen over, say, American trainees because in Korea there is less likelihood of the trainee teacher simply rejecting the theory flat out because of some superstitious belief in a Bronze Age Middle Eastern desert god. In fact, previous studies have shown that in the US, only 16% of people are religiously unaffiliated, whereas this number is about 50% in Korea also. The training given to trainee biology teachers in Korea is very uniform, with them all taking the same classes over the same time period, and the trainees are all roughly the same age. It doesn't do anything to dispel the stereotype that all Asian people are indistinguishable from one another, but in this case, uniformity can have an advantage. Now, evolution is not disputed. Well, it's at least not disputed by anyone who can be taken seriously on the matter. So, what they wanted to find out was what would stop a person accepting a demonstrable scientific theory. Because all the participants in the study had all received the same education on the subject, ignorance of the fact could be ruled out as a significant factor, and what they found out is that it came down to a gut feeling of whether the person felt that it was true or not. A person's acceptance of a scientific theory does not have a bearing in any way on the actual validity of the scientific theory in question. So simply not believing in gravitational theory, for instance, is not going to make you weigh any less, which I know must come as a great personal disappointment to you. In actual fact, the results of the study indicate the very opposite of what you make them out to, indicating instead that disbelief in a strong and valid scientific concept, which underpins just about every aspect of a subject which the person has taken a great deal of time studying, is in fact a matter of rationality and not education. This means that the Mensa membership card that you like to flaunt in the absence of any real academic credentials is even less impressive, because apparently it can now be scientifically demonstrated that the denial of the bleeding obvious can be for no good reason. And this brings us nicely onto your comments regarding the National Centre for Science Education and Climate Change. You refer to the NCSE as the Centre for Science Eradication. However, each week you make it plainly clear that you have no idea what science is, and you seem to think that science is a matter of belief, rather than rational deduction, and that anything outside the range of comprehension afforded by your Mensa membership card is just superstitious nonsense and beyond credibility. You demonstrate this nicely with your attack on the notion of man-made climate change. You personally may believe that no evidence exists for it, but just about every serious climatologist on the planet disagrees with you. 
Somehow, you seem to think that taking a good proportion of the carbon that has been locked up in the Earth's crust over the course of millions of years of geological time as coal, oil and natural gas, and then releasing it into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide over the space of a couple of centuries, while at the same time deforesting vast areas of the planet which soak up this carbon dioxide, locking up the carbon and releasing the oxygen back into the atmosphere, will have absolutely no effect whatsoever. But then again, Ian, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because Jesus is coming back soon, isn't he? And it'll be the end of the world, so what's the point of worrying about fucking up the environment when Judgment Day is almost upon us? The very fact that the National Centre for Science Education has to exist in the first place is a sad indictment of the level of anti-scientific thinking that goes on in North America. Every day, legitimate science education is under attack by dullards like you, who want to teach kids that mankind originated from a mud pie and a spare rib. The entire universe popped into existence 6,000 years ago because an invisible wizard told it to. Then 4,000 years ago, the climate became considerably wetter for a while, and a man had to build a big boat to save all the animals. It is incredible that in the 21st century, good money has to be spent on keeping this twaddle out of the public education system. Of course, endless courtroom defeats don't seem to put you guys off, which is why the National Centre for Science Education is necessary, and that in itself is a travesty, because the day that you do get your own way, North America will start down the path of becoming irrelevant, and eventually Europe will end up sending you food aid, as you wonder why all the technical jobs have gone overseas, infant mortality rates have skyrocketed, and the rest of the world considers you a laughing stock. But then again... I live in the UK, which is a constitutional monarchy, and though we have a democratically elected parliament, bishops sit in the House of Lords, which is the upper house of government, and the head of state is the monarch, who is also the head of the Church of England, and has since the 16th century held the title of Defender of the Faith. Prayer was never removed from schools in the UK, and there are a great many schools that are church schools, or are attached to a local church in some way. And in most schools, morning assembly involves some sort of religious practice, such as singing hymns or saying prayers, and priests regularly make school visits. Yet, despite this, the United Kingdom is one of the most secular countries in Europe. Mainly because by the time that kids grow out of believing in Santa, they've also come to the realisation that Noah and his ark, and even her talking snake, are kids' fables too. We look upon our colonial cousins across the Atlantic as the retarded relation when we hear sorrowful statistics about how nearly 60% of you don't accept evolution as being true, with as many as 40% of Americans thinking it's definitely false. But then again... Maybe it really does all come down to that good feeling that you're talking about. Maybe. Despite living in one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world, where the energy released from splitting atoms is used for warming food, which is served on disposable plastic plates, that is eaten while sat in front of a big glowing screen that shows pictures beamed across the globe by bouncing signals off artificial satellites orbiting the Earth thousands of miles away. These people still have a desperate need to believe that a universe that is wider than twice the distance that light can travel since the beginning of time, that is mostly filled with nothing, there is a galaxy that is one among hundreds of billions in the universe, which contains a star that is one among hundreds of billions in just that galaxy alone. And orbiting around that star, there is the single planet among nine that is the only one known to be capable of supporting life, and this planet is mostly covered in water, but has bits that aren't, which while being mostly in inhabitable, contain areas that do allow people to survive. And of these areas, their area is special, and they are important, and that all of it was created with them in mind, and that despite being one among six billion, the creator of all of this has a special relationship with them, and pays particular attention to their individual wants and needs. Yet, 
Despite being one of the most significant beings in the whole universe, which was created especially for them, their actions have absolutely no impact on the tiniest fraction of an insignificant segment, of a trivial portion of an inconsequential percentage, of just the most minuscule part of the whole, and that it must be something else that's responsible, because it's not as though the entire universe revolves around them. That's like having your cake and eating it, which, I have a good feeling, is something that you personally know an awful lot about.